Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Peter Wonka and Pascal Miller. Uh, Peter is an old friend. We went to Georgia Tech together. He was a postdoc, and I was a student then. He's uh, now an assistant professor at Arizona State University. Uh, Pascal, he was a former researcher at ETH Zurich, and now he's the CEO and co-founder of uh, the new and exciting company, Procedural Link. So take it away. Thanks, Vivek. So um, we're going to split the talk, and I'm going to give the first talk, part of the talk. Uh, yeah, my, my name is Peter Wonka, and I'm, we're going to uh, talk about urban reconstruction modeling for building virtual worlds. So yes, yeah, so our talk is uh, structured like any talk you've seen before, with some introduction at the beginning, results at the end. But So in the middle, what we're going to talk to you about is uh, the concept of modeling architectural content with shape grammars. So this is an uh, academic concept that uh, Pascal and I, uh, we collaborated uh, over the last years, uh, worked on. And we wanna, what you're going to see is also results of one specific system that was implemented. And this is what uh, Pascal is going to release in May 2008 uh, with his company, which is called City Engine. Um, and so the, the two parts that we're going to talk about is first just building virtual worlds uh, everything virtual, and then uh, in the second part of the talk, we're going to talk about uh, how can we um, maybe use this concept of shape grammars for something more along the lines of reconstruction. Um, the, the overall problem that we try to address is the content challenge. And uh, so we would argue that over the last uh, maybe 10 years, in computer graphics, the, the actual rendering part became less and less of a bottleneck, but that the art and content was uh, taking over as the major problem. So now you have all these really powerful rendering engines down to these really cheap uh, platforms for playing games. And uh, the question now is, where do all these detailed models and all the content come from so that uh, interesting uh, things can be generated? And, and out of all the content that can possibly be generated or that is important, what we focus on is uh, architectural content like cities, buildings, and, and, and interiors. And, and uh, we, we hope that most of you believe us that uh, architectural content is actually extremely important. And you can probably from your own experience see that a lot of maybe movies and games and other products, uh, they, they include architectural content. And, uh, we also think that there is a big problem in efficiently generating detailed content. And uh, we're going to propose a solution to that. And the solution is uh, procedural modeling. And uh, procedural modeling somehow goes, is similar to maybe scripting or programming. So we want to maybe program a building. And um, how this looks like is we want to somehow encode architectural knowledge. So we want to encode knowledge in this uh, procedural way so that we have information about spatial, structural relating, uh, relationships, about semantics of uh, architecture. And now this, the, the idea is that this encoding of architectural knowledge is fairly small and compact. But with this smaller and compact representation, we can again go out and procedurally generate like vast cityscape. So, so then this is where the efficiency comes from. It's like we have this smaller encoding of architectural knowledge, but we can create a huge amount of very detailed content. Um, and uh, the applications that we go to primarily are entertainment, like uh, games and movies, but we also had successful collaborations with architecture, archaeology, urban planning, as you will see later on in the talk. So, if you want to start modeling a city, then uh, what we suggest is a top-down approach. And this is something that Pascal worked on for his master thesis in 2001, where the idea was you still want to design a city, you have absolutely nothing. So you might want to start out by painting some maps or load, downloading them, downloading them, or you know, taking them from Google, Google Maps, for example. So you might start with a land water map. You might want to start with a hand-painted uh, population density map with a map for terrain elevation. And then if you have these maps, uh, you can start out by uh, growing a city, 
as you see on the uh, left side, with an L system like process. And uh, so one of the concepts that uh, were suggested is to actually grow major streets first and then try to fill in uh, the minor streets. And you know, while the machinery is similar to using L system for trees, of course, in the details, uh, uh, everything is different. And uh, uh, we have to kind of encode the uh, inherent properties of street networks to make it look uh, fairly realistic. And on the right, you see a model of uh, virtual Manhattan. I guess it's the land water map of uh, Manhattan. Um, so now. <coughs> You have the street network. Um, so, so maybe there are two more examples. So what you see here are two possible interpretations of uh, Zurich. So starting from a land uh, water map of Zurich, you see the beautiful lake here in the middle. Um, you can, by controlling the parameters, make it mo look more like a Western pattern, what you see on the left. Or you can, make it, you can generate some radial patterns, what you see on the right. And on the bottom, you see a rendering of that. So what we have now is a street graph with uh, uh, intersections as vertices, and then there are some polylines. And uh, the procedural model also generates some uh, attributes for these polylines. And one of the most important attributes is, there are other ones, is the street width. And out of this representation that you see to the left of this slide, um, then there are some procedural modeling steps to, to generate the full-blown street geometry. And uh, so we want to place uh, all the signs, and we want to place uh, street lighting, and traffic lights, and mailboxes, and all that, which works fairly nice procedurally with uh, the shape grammars that we develop. Um, so then, then we're kind of done with the streets, and then we proceed further uh, top down. So the next thing is the division into lots. So if you start at the left side of this slide, then here you see the street graph again, and then after we model 3D geometry, I mean, a bit of the, the streets take some more space, but after the streets have been extended, then, then still there, there's some uh, what we call parcels left. And, and then the next question is, how can we subdivide these parcels into individual building lots, so into, into individual property that you could go and buy? And uh, yeah, so here we also use, again, the concept of shape grammars, but uh, you know, there are these constraints, so we have to respect geometric constraints. Uh, like building lots should be mainly rectangular so that you can build a house on them. We can't have organically shaped uh, building lots or something. There's subdivision according to population and land use. And uh, also typically, if you buy a piece of property to build your house on, you, you would love to have some street access because otherwise uh, you have some major problems. Um, so now we have the lots and then the next step is uh, we want to put some buildings on the lots. And what you see here is uh, an example where we actually started uh, developing a shape grammar for uh, one specific uh, type of architecture inspired by one specific type of building that uh, can be found in Zurich. And uh, so this is, a, this is a, to the right side, you see more the, uh, mainly that we really want to go into a lot of details in, in this virtual world. So you see a lot of the ornaments are modeled by uh, geometry, and to the left side, you see a bit more of the structure. Um, so we have some uh, buildings now, but if you're in the in a city like New York, there's not much else. You have streets, buildings, but uh, if you move to the suburbs, uh, we also want to place other objects. So what you see uh, on on this slide is some examples of using this shape grammar to place other objects that are important. So if you have your a piece of property, you might want to procedurally generate a fence. And uh, there are also procedural rules for the placement of vegetation. So if you look at these examples, we're actually not in the business of tree modeling itself. We're just in the, uh, we just try to procedurally generate uh, the patterns of how these, uh, these trees and uh, this other vegetation is placed. So you see very regular patterns, for example, on the side of a street where it's more all the trees are equidistant, and then you have some uh, semi-regular patterns. Maybe everything's around the fence, but, uh, but then the, the distance is a bit more chaotic or just a totally 
free uh, placement of vegetation as in a forest. And you know, you, you not only see the vegetation, but there's also modeling of swimming pools and of pathways and uh, fence and driveways and things like that. Um, now, this is more or less the pipeline uh, high on a high level. Let's look at some example projects that uh, we took on in, over the last years. And what you see here, this is a reconstruction of Pompeii that uh, allegedly was uh, destroyed by a volcano. And, and the thing is, Pompeii is a very nice case study for archaeology because a lot of information is there. So um, what we tried to do is, through collaboration with some uh, archaeologists, come up with a reasonable interpretation how Pompeii might have looked like uh, 2,000 years ago. And we want to do that with uh, an extreme amount of detail. So this is uh, one of the largest models we've created. It's not only large in size, but it's really a huge amount of detail per building. So if you look at some of these buildings, maybe the one at the front, you see that really each individual roof brick is modeled with polygons, and you get up to maybe uh, a few hundred thousand polygons for each individual building. So then the whole model goes up to maybe a billion of polygons. Now, and that creates all sorts of uh, problems. So you cannot expect uh, us to just render a billion polygons. So what we have to do here is also integrate some level of detail notion and use some simple geometry in the back. Um, this is another example. Uh, and this one uh, kind of shows how this technology could be used in urban planning. So this collaboration was, was done with urban planners. Uh, they, they looked at uh, in, uh, the place in Singapore. And the question was, uh, how can we kind of show a reasonable interpretation how the city would develop in the future? And we don't only want to show some maybe density maps in 2D uh, of the population, but we want to capture the essence of the geometry that is already there and kind of try to extend this type and uh, flavor of uh, urban structure out to the new places uh, where the city is going to be extended. Um, yeah, another example, some also in collaboration with archaeology, maybe. Uh, so when I started to take courses on architecture, you typically start by studying uh, antique, uh, ancient, uh, the like temples. And you know, if, if you also took some classes, you remember like the Doric and Ionic and Corinthian order. And the really nice part of this uh, ancient architecture is that on the one hand, it's it's very structured. Uh, so there seem to be at least a lot of rules. It's, it's very good for uh, modeling with shape grammars. But on the other hand, there are also lots of exceptions to the rules and only maybe the uh, authors in trying to simplify the architecture, they, they only create the illusion of rules. So, so we have a lot of regularity, but still enough challenges to uh, make the modeling problem interesting. So and again, this is a model that's fairly heavy, I think several million polygons. So if you would just go with a a regular polygonal modeling toolkit, then eventually you, you, you might not even be able to move the model around much because there's so many mo uh, polygons in the details. Um, so this example should show uh, that uh, maybe a novice user can generate, you know, this is modern architecture, can, can generate interesting con uh, content in, uh, in, in very short time. Uh, so we had someone uh, experiment with uh, City engine that had some design background, I guess, and you know th this is something they could get maybe after a day. So this is starting from scratch, no idea, but experience in modeling and uh, generating a city. Uh, this is another example uh, from uh, archaeology uh, to show also a bit breadth of what we do. So this is uh, Mayan architecture, also some older architecture, uh, and and so we worked with archaeologists to come up with. Uh, some rules that capture the specific type of architecture. And um, so, so the main part here is we're not in the business of placing these, uh, we're not modeling these very elaborate ornaments that you see here. So these would have to be generated by uh, an artist or a modeler uh, in, in traditional modeling packages. But what we can do is we can, uh, we can encode the uh, placement and the spatial layout and uh, the dimensions of all these individual elements. Um, so uh, now after these examples, I'd like to give some uh, at least high-level overview 
of uh, how modeling with uh, the shape grammar works. So uh, that what we do, what we did is in 2006 we we introduced this uh, shape grammar that we call uh, CGA shape, and um, so the idea is we have human readable rules. You'll see some examples soon uh, with a notation like L systems. Um, we we will show some uh, examples on how can we model facades, but also mass models. Um, we don't want to impose very unrealistic restrictions, but we also don't want to go overboard to make it a totally general ma modeling package. And uh, yeah, let's, let's look at some uh, example here. So uh, we want to model basically top down. So we do a rule driven modification and replacement of individual shapes. So if you look to the left of this slide, then you see a temple model starting out with four basic shapes. And then we iteratively evolve the design by this rule-driven replacement. So we always take one shape, let's say maybe the roof shape further along, and then we replace this shape with multiple other shapes and so on. So you also see how the columns start to develop, and then the columns get broken down into individual parts and the more and more details are generated. And, and while this is not always the case, you see that if you model carefully or in, in a lot of models, the intermediate modeling steps are also some reasonable higher level interpretation of uh, what this temple could look like. So you could not only use the last uh, image shown here on the slide, but you also could use the second to last as a fairly good model. of some parts, mm -hmm. how are they related in any way? Can you just completely replace everything? Are there any constraints? How, how free are you? Um, so, so, when, so typically we want to take one part and take out, and, 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 and mainly try to do a local replacement. However, we'll see later on that there has to be some, the rules have to ask a bit about the context. So, so what we'll, uh, what I'll show in five, five minutes or so are two concepts that we use to uh, query the context in the rules. But pretty much the easy modeling works if every shape is by itself. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so how, does, is, how is each individual shape encoded uh, or a rule? So, so maybe let's start, off, uh, start with uh, how these rules look like. So the main thing is that a rule has a predecessor. This is a shape that is going to be replaced. And you know, there's a condition and some probability. But then the main thing is the predecessor shape is going to be replaced. And then there's some encoding of the successor. So this one shape can be replaced with either no shapes. So it's going to get killed, more or less. It can be replaced with a modified shape. Or very often, it's actually being replaced with multiple other uh, typically smaller shapes. Um, and, the, and an individual shape. Uh, you see this example here on the slide. So we need some identifiers so that might have a name. Uh, then it has some geometry. And uh, we also use this concept, which is an extension to this uh, oriented uh, coordinate system that is uh, very popular in tree modeling. We call it scope. So we not only have an or this coordinate system in space, but along each axis, we also have uh, a, a size. Uh, so that gives somehow a box in space, which is often the bounding box of the shape. Now, let's look at some of the shape uh, rules that we use. Um, and uh, there are going to be several examples. So the first one, which is typically used for mass modeling, are transformations that you know, most of you are probably very familiar with, such as translation, scale, and rotation. So if you look at the example on the bottom of the slide, you see some rules of how one shape, you could imagine it as a one bigger box, gets replaced by two smaller boxes and a cylinder. And this would be a rule to maybe start some more interesting mass model. And you see, for, before each shape, like these two cubes or cylinders are placed, they always get translated and scaled into the appropriate position. Now, then if you want to model facades, the thing that we found the most uh, helpful is, is to use actually also a top-down splitting uh, to, to model facade. So what, what you see here is uh, you see one facade, which is a rectangle. And this facade is being split in five 
uh, individual elements. So you have the first floor and legend and three other floors. And the key here is to somehow encode the rule so that it is valid for a larger range of rectangles. So independent of how big this input rectangle, input facade is, we always have to come up with some reasonably proportioned split. But in this example, there's always only going to be a split along the up axis, and then we're going to have five other elements. And another split that you see here is uh, something more along the lines of uh, repeating elements. And uh, this type of split would say something like, OK, you have a floor, maybe now place as many windows as, as there are space. And you know each window should be uh, size 2, approximately. So let's hopefully see how that looks like. So you have you know, this one type of rule. It's not only this one up there. So you see how this would work out and how the designs that we go after are size independent, so they can be applied to a larger range of facades. Another interesting concept is the component split. And so what we explore in the framework is switching dimensions. So we can start with three-dimensional shapes, but then we also can kind of split down to two-dimensional shapes, maybe the faces or one-dimensional. We can split down to points. And, but then when we have these uh, lower-dimensional shapes, we still try to keep this or oriented coordinate uh, system so that uh, once we're down to 1D, later on we might get back up to 3D to actually place 3D geometry. And this is helpful for maybe placing uh, ornaments or placing tiles on a roof uh, or modeling the facades. Um, and, and then, uh, yeah, so we need to manage a lot of assets. And I mean, this goes a lot into software engineering, but apart from uh, just the geometry, we also need, uh, you know, we need, I mean, we need to load meshes, textures, shaders, uh, and do all that. So you see an example of maybe several textures for uh, a window. Um, so uh, now given these rules, the question is, uh, the rules are only one thing. We still need to uh, give some idea of how to model with these rules. And uh, as I indicated before, so if we want to model facades, then we typically go in the following order. That is, we want to start with a facade as a rectangle, then split into maybe floors or ledges. And then these floors itself, we want to split into a concept that we invented because we didn't find any appropriate uh, thing in architecture. So we're pretty sure someone has a name for it, but uh, we just reinvented it. Um, so this is the concept of a tile. And the tile, this is what you see to the left of this slide, is somehow a window or a door plus the surrounding wall. And, and why we need this tile is because we want to have a clean split of a floor into only tiles. So then when we split into what we call tiles, we can really get a, a clean subdivision. And then later on, these tiles are going to be broken down into wall, window, uh, other ornaments, and so on. Um, this is a, another example just to show you maybe the complexity of uh, encoding uh, some architecture. So this is a temple that uh, uh, Pascal uh, either photographed on his vacation trips or downloaded from the internet. And uh, so this is, we wanted to remodel that. And uh, what you see to the left is somehow these are the main rules that you need to encode this architecture. And what we uh, kind of leave out in this example is the exact dimensions and the placement of textures and materials. But uh, in principle, you see that the description of this temple here would be pretty short. And uh, from this description, you can then go on and create the family of uh, temples. Um, so then uh, uh, we talked about facades before. But typically, if you want to go into mass modeling, actually, uh, the splitting we tried, it's, it's very, uh, it's much simpler, but it's actually not that successful. It turns out that if you want to create mass models, you basically want to assemble some basic solids, such as cylinders and blocks, and you, you want to take them and kind of stick them into together so uh, to, to kind of create the mass model. And uh, uh, you not only need uh, ma uh, these basic blocks, as you see on the top here, but we also need some basic blocks for 
roof shapes. And but again, actually, a lot of these more complex roofs. If you go into geometry, it's uh, pretty much a nightmare, right? But if you take some basic solids and stick them together, you can get some very complex roofs that are actually uh, pretty much exactly how uh, the buildings are created. Um, this is an example for mass modeling, and um, so the main thing we want to show here is that this mass, this, this whole example was generated with four rules only. So we have four rules of uh, a few, so basically four basic mass models, and the rules then have some uh, stochastic variation to them. And all each of these rules just start with a building lot as an axiom. Uh, and uh, so if you set the parameters well, so you can get you know, fairly large, and we could extend that uh, fairly wide, fairly large and realistic uh, uh, urban model, at least from, for, the, for the masses. Um, so uh, then there are some technical issues, because this concept of how to modeling facades and how to model uh, mass, ma the building mass, doesn't totally trivially work together. So what you see on this example is that if we now take all these solids, let's say we take seven boxes, you stick them together somehow, you can generate a really interesting mass model. But then if each box or shape goes off by itself and kind of splits down some facades, you get lots of unwanted intersections. So if you look at this example here, um, typically you will see all these windows at the top of one shape are cut off, and all these windows here are cut off. And if I actually show you a rendering uh, of a city in flyover pretty fast, there's a really high chance you're not going to notice. But uh, you know, if it's just something more like an interactive game application, then uh, there are going to be huge complaints. So uh, what we do is we, we kind of introduce two concepts to um, uh, kind of handle this scenario. And uh, we can only, on a very high level, so we kind of use this concept of uh, dominant construction lines of a shape uh, or of a design so that shapes kind of snap to these dominant construction lines. And the second concept that we include is that, um, that, that shapes and rules can query intersection with other shapes to kind of have some context sensitive design. Now the, the um, the, the problem is, uh, geometrically, it's, it's extremely, or it's reasonably simple, right? So when you just say, oh, I want to have the perfect triangulation of only the free space on the facade, I mean, you can get the medium complexity ge geometric program and do it. But if you just solve it geometrically, there's actually no, no way uh, you can do a lot of design with it. So the, the real challenge here is, how can we uh, have the rules still be simple so that we can design something, but uh, generate uh, fairly complex uh, designs. So this is an example. Uh, so we, we use this a lot for office buildings, uh, how this snapping and intersection or occlusion uh, can be used to generate some results. Now, uh, this is where I'm going to turn it over to Pascal. And uh, he's going to talk more about uh, modeling in the context of uh, reconstruction. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. <coughs> so, um, welcome. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about uh, um, the reconstruction uh, based on, on photographs. So the idea of, of this, of of the method which I which I'm going to introduce is a uh, is that that we are in the pipeline after the photogrammetric uh, guys have have ac acquired the what they I think uh, they call it shoe boxes so it means uh, they they have all these solids the mass models and uh, if they have ground based or image or or airborne imagery and um, they have they have these mass models with uh, kind of textures uh, on these mass models. <clears throat> so that's that's where we uh, in there we come into play. So we look now at these textures uh, which are uh, rectified on on the on the on the facades. <clears throat> so you see here's uh, such a texture, and the idea is now that we. Uh, <clears throat> 
that we detect the structure of the phosphate. So see here first. So we uh, we split it into the single tiles, and afterwards uh, we subdivide each tile. So it's are really the basic concepts uh, which which Peter uh, showed before. So we reverse these concepts and uh, and and uh, can find automatically such structures. So what we do then. Uh, Non-automatically, you can see here is the adjustment of the depth of the of the of the of the elements of the architectural elements. So at the end, <coughs> you have uh, created a, a representation in about uh, a facet representation, which kind of really looks good in about two to three minutes. <coughs> so um, and this this work was uh, presented at last year's SIGGRAPH. So, uh, so I'm going to show uh, a few slides about it, how it is done. <coughs> so the first idea was uh, we had to find out uh, the symmetry. So we used a symmetry detection um, algorithm called uh, mutual information. The idea is that you have two, um, a, a, a two-dimensional search base. So uh, we are looking for uh, where is the best uh, symmetry axis and where is the and and where where is the best range where is symmetry <coughs> so you see it here so we do that um, iteratively again and again and at the end we receive something which we call uh, the the irreducible facade <coughs> so and then on this facade we we have to find the splitting lines and here uh, it's it's kind of a basic uh, concept. So it's it's an edge detection, um, trying to find edges. Uh, for for example, horizontal splitting lines uh, are where where we have horizontal edges and no vertical edges. We get then some candidates, and at the end uh, we have to find uh, um, also concerning uh, um, floor height ranges, etc. So we have we have an optimization problem which can be solved quite easy. <coughs> At the end, we expand this grid back onto the facade, and the good thing is now we have we have these uh, these numbers here, our cluster IDs. So you see here, um, so all these all these clusters are detected as uh, same structure. So um, you see we have here now six different tiles, <coughs> and that helps now a lot in the next step, which is uh, the local. Um, the local split detection. So here the idea is um, we we try to find edges and, and are going from the outside to the inside and uh, and we always take the best edge and uh, sometimes uh, we can take two edges if they are the same of, of same size. So at the end what we get is a is a is a representation like like a split grammar. And uh, the problem is now, as you can see, it's you, you always it's vision, so it's 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 computer vision, so it's it's always uh, not very very correct. And uh, so actually, here's here's what what came out just for for the first step on all tiles. <coughs> but now we have what what we found before is we have all this symmetry information, and uh, on each on each step we we make use of this symmetry information. And, uh, and because of that, we can synchronize the, um, the different um, tiles. And then at the end, it looks uh, quite, quite, uh, quite correct everywhere. So the, the only problem what you have is uh, if you have tiles like this, where you, where you just have one representation. There it's like uh, the typical computer vision problems, means you have to tune thresholds, etc. So, but as soon as you have a tile uh, which which is about uh, which which has more than three three different um, instances of this really looking uh, similar looking, then um, the thing gets fairly stable. <coughs> so the next step, um, we try to uh, fit our assets into uh, into uh, into this into the found elements. So it's the same asset library which uh, Peter presented before. 
Um, you can see here, so it's not exactly the same asset li library. It's uh, what we did is uh, we we took that asset library and uh, we rendered 2D representations out of it. So we have for each asset we have also a 2D representation. These are the, these can be seen here. These are the 2D representations. So this is also done automatically with a with a Maya ML script. So quite easy. <coughs> Then uh, we again lose mutual information to compare um, these 2D representations with the with the with the texture. And if we find some someone, some, then we take it. Again, we can use uh, this this for uh, um, the whole uh, symmetry detection uh, helps to make it stable. <coughs> so now, uh, but the the cool thing is now. That after we have found this representation, we can go back to uh, to the rule set. So we can convert the found model into a rule set. So what you see here is uh, you see the shape facade, which now is going to be replaced by a subdivision into floors. And, uh, and the floor two, for example, is 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 replaced by a subdivision into a tile and the repeat of tile four. Tile 4 um, is, is uh, subdivided into other regions and for example this region is, uh, is then at the end is, a, is an asset which means it's just a wall shader actually. <coughs> so so means uh, we, have, we, have the, we have the semantics for floors, tiles and the, and, and the elements on the ground floor. On the on the on the, on the leaves the leaves of the of the of the sh of the shape tree, so um, and another cool thing is that implicitly it's uh, the rules are size independent. So means you can uh, you can apply them on different sized facades, or you can uh, you can of course you also can copy paste the the design or change change the design, whatever. <coughs> so here are some results. So on the left you see the input, on the right uh, the reconstruction. So a good thing is also uh, when when we are doing this uh, this element matching with the assets, um, we also can use the shaders of the assets. So that that's the reason why there there's on the right side there's reflection, etc. So each of these facets was created in 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 about three minutes. And as you can see, th th these have been all um, all ground-based uh, imagery. So one of the good thing is that our algorithm uh, uh, works also on on low-res imagery. So what you can see here is uh, airborne imagery, which uh, has about the resolution of 30 to uh, 40. Uh, centimeters, and uh, so yeah, you uh, Google Earth, um, you know it. Um, the textures are, are when you are on street level, it's the resolution. You have resolution problems. Also, it's actually I think it's it's a uh, it's it's a much more bandwidth problem. Uh, I don't know if you can can uh, pipe through all all textures or stream all textures in a in a three D environment. And uh, so what we have here is a is is a representation which is which is a uh, way more um, way more compact and uh, and of course um, you can you can go uh, very uh, very near and uh, yeah. So th this is a modeling session. This is all live done. So here, um, I, I, shortly, I shortly noted it. So we can use this, these representations um, um, to, to, to accelerate the rendering. For example, um, we, we took the depth map, uh, factorized them, and, uh, and solved them in real time during rendering. So what you see here on the right is a uh, is it's not just just because of PowerPoint, but uh, these are this is really a massive, massive scene. 
and uh, and if, if it's on in PowerPoint, it's 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 really um, it's, it's more than 60 frames per second and uh, really fast on a on a standard modern PC. <coughs> and these are representations. Um, excuse me. So we have the different, um, we, we take different um, dev maps and we can, we can um, it, it, it's like an, uh, an, uh, a uh, single view. Yeah. But so, so one representation is the depth, the depth map and the other one is the material index map. And then we also need to compress acceleration data structures for the, for the ray tracer. So they would like a single value decomposition. So you try to capture like a few clusters with this matrix vectorization, and then yeah, you have it. Like, okay, and you reconstruct from that locally. Right. So mm -hmm. it's all everything is reconstructed online. So um, so now I come to the results section. Of the of the talk, so I'm going to show uh, some procedural modeling examples, what we have done with the city engine, and uh, etc. So, as people already said, uh, we implemented all this stuff in 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 a program called City Engine, and uh, and that's that's what I'm now doing after my PhD is uh, commercializing this thing, <coughs> and uh, we, have, we we plan to release it in May. So, what you see here is a uh, is a screenshot of the prototype. Um, so when you have a procedural modeling solution, uh, it's very important that you have uh, um, um, lots of different OpenGL views. So it means uh, it's it's a it's a computational design system, and uh, and often because you are you are really modeling on a high level, it's it's sometimes very hard to understand. Uh, What's going on? So, so we have to really visually debug, be able to visually debug uh, um, your um, your uh, models and your rules. And uh, what is it's also a little GIS, um, little GIS editor is is integrated uh, to to handle large scale scenes. And what's also very important is the is the whole interactive editing stuff. So so everything has to be interactive. And uh, so what you see here is is for example a stochastic rule. So you can just um, the Pompe rules have been stochastic. Means uh, when you are not happy with the building, you just can click on it and and uh, just change the random seed which generates the the building, and then it creates you an, another building. And this can be done also in real time. And uh, we also offer uh, visual offering tools where you can visually edit the the, the rules and uh, and modify the, the windows, etc. <coughs> the what I found most important uh, of this work was actually the what is the workflow behind procedural modeling, especially when you want to build weird virtual worlds. Um, one thing was uh, the whole reconstruction thing when. when where we use image-based methods, then it's kind of uh, um, uh, clear what you have to do. But uh, when you want to create a virtual world or, or some new architectural buildings or whatever, then the main problem was not to encode the design, as it was not to, to uh, learn the design, um, to learn the shape grammar and, and encode it with it. The main problem was to analyze the architecture and understand the, understand the parameter of the architecture. Because at the end, architecture is, is also kind of an art, and, uh, and there it's, it's highly sub subjective, and, uh, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, but afterwards, after you have understand the parameters, etc., then uh, the process is, is really easy to do and can be done very fast. <clears throat> so what you see here um, is, is an example. You see here on the left um, the conceptual design we got from, from artists. <coughs> that, that was for a short movie. And then they, they created, um, we created here uh, two drafts. And what, what was now very interesting for us was uh, um, during production, they, they decided to change the urban layout here on the right. 
uh, and they wanted to have a, more like a mega city urban layout. And if you are in with traditional methods, something like this is is, is kind of un, uh, impossible, as you cannot change, uh, you, you cannot do such a major design change during during production. And uh, but that's one of the big advantages of procedural modeling. We just could apply this. We just had to change the mass models, which uh, took about two days, and then uh, reapply all these all these things. <coughs> So some some results. Um, the Petronas Tower was one of the first buildings we did uh, with the CJ shape grammar, and uh, actually I, I think it's quite cool as you c you can create with without if it, with about seven to ten um, rules you can create a, a, a building like this uh, consisting of of uh, half a million of polygons, and uh, of course I have to say. Um, the, the Petronas Tower is a very uh, formalized and rule-based building. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Another example you can see here. That's that was uh, our test scenario to to uh, to uh, check if the if the shape interaction means the occlusion, the snapping, which Peter talked about, is working well. So at the end, we liked it so much, we we rendered it properly. And uh, so what we animated here, we animated the mass model uh, uh, manually. And what you, and at the end, it looked like this. So what you see here is a, you can, for, for any configuration, we do not care what, what special configuration you have, the, the design is working always uh, inherently. <coughs> so that's a, that's really really practical. So you can change the things, and everything is always uh, always like it should. <coughs> Other things you can do with the with the grammar is um, you can create uh, floor plans. There you can see here. So that was for a project in Dubai. Um, they they are changing the the um, so so the the ground area is changing of the floor plan. The ratios are changing. Etc. And, uh, and then you see the the elevator, which is which is of course static, etc. <coughs> then uh, the Pompeii mo the Pompeii uh, example, you see here. Uh, this is this is the input data which which uh, archaeologists gave us. Um, here on the left uh, is the is the population density. Here is the uh, age map, uh, land use map, and here's just topology. <coughs> Furthermore, the archaeologists told us a lot about how the how the arch architecture there looked like. So they uh, they told us things like uh, they had huge doors, and they they gave us measurements and paintings, etc. And uh, we then had the had the task to encode this knowledge into into rule sets. And uh, we ended up having uh, having a rule set consisting of about uh, more than 130, I think, rules. Um, and here's the animation. So what you see here, um, we created this this in about one month. And uh, I think with traditional methods, uh, it would take you about uh, six months to reconstruct such a massive model. And uh, yeah, it's also as Peter said, we have different level of uh, we have level of details. So um, we are we are using it also in in for uh, especially the Pompeii model for for real time environments. So we have, for example, this this project called Cyberwalk, where, which is kind of like uh, like the holodeck in uh, in Star Trek. Um, means it, it's an omnidirect omnidirectional treadmill where you can walk around everywhere. So, and then you have HMDs with, with this Pompeii model, so you can really uh, walk around uh, in Pompeii and, and stuff like this. So this is one of the projects we are doing, and there we, are, there we have to use a level of detail, of course. Other stuff we are, which we are doing is uh, um, we are placing crowds into our cities. Uh, this, is, this can be done very easily because we have 
so many so much information about our cities we have all this all this um, all this semantic information like, like it, it sounds simple but for example we know where the doors are and uh, and we know the windows um, we have we have all the all the land the, the land use um, the land use uh, map so we know uh, this 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 might be a bakery or or, or or another another shop. So we have all this information. I give a short. So this was done together with uh, EPFL, Daniel Talman's group. Again, everything in real time. And for, so, f for example, um, what, what they did is, uh, so we have different areas, rich and poor area, and then uh, <coughs> different uh, th different targets and uh, and and people are behaving so behaviors so so for example uh, people go into a bakery and buy a bread and come out with a bread <coughs> i don't know maybe it's ah here here they all come out they they go in without bread and come out with a bread <laughs> it's really <laughs> yeah so th this is work in progress Here you see another example. Um, here is a. What I think what what is really important is uh, when you when you have urban urban scenes is uh, is, is all this is is the vegetation. I think it it makes this this this, uh, this richness in in the three D space, and uh, so he, here we have applied it onto a onto a suburban scene. For example, we we also had to apply the the grammar to to to, to place the swimming pools and, uh, and yeah and everything. And other thing which we are currently working on is uh, is interactive urban simulation. Means uh, we want to simulate uh, the growth of cities as a um, as a real sim real uh, real urban simulation, uh, but interactive. And there you can also um, play around um, with different uh, parameters. So you can create your own cities, uh, which which pop up. And uh, so that was one of my students did that with with this with this urban simulation system. So it was. So what you see here is uh, is 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 is. Uh, excuse me. Is a is a city which 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 grows in uh, about several years, and uh, it's for the computer animation festival. So it's a uh, it's really a uh, it's arty. <laughs> Here, uh, the different the different colors are uh, represent different land uses. You see, it's the it's a logo. <coughs> Here are the final results. Here's some more results. Um, um, so this is stuff which which we have done with uh, with short movies. Um, so we created, for example, the backgrounds for short movies. So that was the actual um, one of my main motivations when I when I begin with the city engine. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so this is this is Venice. It was done in one day, and uh, so so it's, it's it was done in one day because it's 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 very low resolution. So it's uh, it's not very detailed resolution. But the cool thing there, for example, was uh, we did not have access to the to the to the land, um, to the 
to the to the to the street and work. So what what we we, we just created some kind of a, of of a, of distribution with uh, by generating the streets, etc. And then we just projected the satellite image onto it. And uh, I think that's that's quite nice for our flights, etc. <coughs> So, as I said, uh, you are really, really efficient uh, in, 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 in modeling. Here, that's a project which we did um, again with Dubai. And uh, so that was for the World Island. I don't know if you have heard of it. That's uh, one of these crazy Dubai projects. And uh, so architects, uh, they calculated building envelopes for this, uh, for this uh, World Island. And, uh, and then, more or less, uh, one day before the, they had to show it to the Sheikh, these these building envelopes, they they found out that the Sheikh they, the Sheikh wants to see some uh, some three D. <laughs> he, he wants to see some 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 kind of abstract ideas of of buildings. So what we had to do was uh, we had to create uh, in these envelopes uh, kind of these strange looking uh, buildings. Uh, what is the city engine is also very can be used for uh, creating science fiction cities like this, uh, which I think is also um, so. This one was uh, involved by um, inspired by Fifth Element, etc. And here, here's another city, the last one uh, that was also for 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 the movie, short movie. And here the director told me, uh, yeah, make a really really big city, and uh, at the end uh, it was too big. So, uh, so he cut it out. Mm. But <coughs> yeah. So, maybe sh short discussion. Um, what I think, what where precision modeling is go is going to. I definitely think now with the with all the new user interaction techniques and paradigms, uh, and uh, especially with multi-touch, sketch-based, etc. And in combination with with uh, with procedural modeling, I think this. Is this is going to be the tools uh, which which allow uh, to create and publish uh, 3D 3D content uh, for non-expert users and really make make 3D available to make 3D content creation available to to the masses. Um, I think it's it's a little bit uh, an, another thinking which is which is needed here a little bit of technology evangelism, maybe um, because it's what 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 we do here is a. Uh, we really encode the design with the we encode the design knowledge in the computer, so it's not like you, that the computer is just a just a, a pen or li like in CAD for example. For, in CAD, what you do is actually the same thing that you can do on with a pen more or less, and uh, and and yeah. So I think computers more than than also just calculating simul simulation and optimization. So it's really um, it, it really gives you new possibilities uh, how you can how you can create content uh, when you bring in the, your 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 design knowledge into with with for example grammars uh, into into the computer and I think it gives you all new levels of artistic directability etc. So these are the people which we like to thank and uh, so. That was it for the talk. Thank you very much.